Amen. Welcome to Ashton United Methodist Church. It is good to gather together today as we praise God. My name is Emily Berkowitz. I'm the pastor here, and it is a joy to have you today in worship. Um, as we get started, a couple of announcements. We are headed into Lent this week. Um, we will be kicking off Lent with a service on Ash Wednesday. Our Ash Wednesday service will be over Zoom. We uh, tried that last year out of necessity, um, and that for format worked pretty well, so we're going to try it again this year. Um, we are sending out um, your ashes in the mail. Um, your ashes are a temporary tattoo that you'll receive in the mail. Um, and so if you are not um, already receiving mails and emails from us, um, we'll send the Zoom link via email this week. Um, and then you may have already gotten your uh, temporary tattoo in the mail. If not, it's coming soon. Um, so if you are not on our mailing or email list and would like to be and would like to participate on Wednesday, let me know. That will be Wednesday evening at 7.30. Um, next Wednesday, uh, the first Sunday of Lent after Ash Wednesday, we'll be beginning a new study, which will also be over Zoom. And it's going to be called um, Surprised by Hope. Rethinking Heaven, Resurrection, and the Mission of the Church. And so if you'd like to participate in that, we'd love to have you take part in that. Um, you can order a book yourself, or you can let me know as soon as possible um, that you need one, and I'll get one for you. Um, if you are ordering your book yourself, just pay attention to the last line in that announcement, because I want to make sure you get the right book. There are, um, there's a book with an identical name and cover, and I want to make sure you get a participant's guide. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that, just let me know as well. And now I invite you to stand as you are able and comfortable, and we'll join together in our opening hymn, which is actually going to be two hymns um, blended one after the next as we turn to God in praise. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and majesty worship his majesty.
Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Um, this is the call to worship. If you could join in in the bold, that would be great. Beyond our busyness, above the cold winter floor, there is glory rising born of heaven and reaching out to each one of us. A light that shines through the clouds, an invitation seeking all of who we are that transfigures the world, that transforms despair into hope, that brings life from the cross, where old life ends and new life is born. In glory, Jesus meets us here, raising from the depths of the valley of the height of the mountain, carrying the weight of our humanity to the heights of heaven's glory. Let us worship from the mountain and hear again. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. We rise at his voice, telling us not to fear and return to the face the world with new vision. Amen. We'll turn to God in prayer together today. Um, not next week, but the following one, um, we, will, we'll re- we will return to something um, uh, more nor- our, um, to joys and concerns the way we did them pre-pandemic, where if you'd like to offer one um, as you are here on Sunday, we'll have a mic that you can offer up your prayer concern and we'll include those together in prayer. Throughout the pandemic, um, we've been asking you to give them to me ahead of time Um, but you'll be able to do uh, pop-up prayer requests beginning um, the week after next. Um, We'll include in our prayers today a request that I got in advance um, for Bill and Eleanor Crosley, who are former members here, um, and include them in prayer for some health issues they've been having. Let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, We come to you. We come to you from many different places. We come to you from the heights of the mountain and the depths of the valley. We come to you knowing that you are bigger than the wildest things that we can imagine. That you are greater than the deepest longings of our hearts. And so we bring all of this to you. Gracious God, we come to you today with the things that worry us and that lay on our hearts. Send your healing, O oh God, your strength upon all who are sick, upon all who are going through surgeries, all who are receiving treatment, We include in our prayers today, Bill and Eleanor, prayers for them and their strength and healing. We pray for those who mourn, O God, knowing that you do the comforting. Praying that those who are struggling in this time feel surrounded by your love. And by love in flesh, embodied by people around them. For those who are feeling lost and don't know which way to turn, God, we pray for wisdom, and wisdom for all who are making decisions right now as we navigate another stage of the pandemic. We continue to pray for wisdom and strength for all who are leading. And God, We pray for wisdom of the world and its leaders in the midst of global struggle and unrest. We pray for your peace. God of peace, our hearts are heavy. Our brains struggle to even keep up. We come to you in a wounded world with prayers for those who sit in the crossfires of violence and war. Surround the people of Ukraine, O God. 
mothers who carry babies into subway shelters, fathers holding their heads in their hands and children absorbing trauma. God, we don't know the words to pray. We don't know what each day will bring. We know we can't bomb our way to peace. And that you are the God of peace. And so in our unknowing and our brokenness, we simply come to you. Comfort the crying and heal the hurt. Tend the aching and soothe those who are fearful. Make us instruments of your peace. Give your world hope, O oh God. Give us hope of a people who believe that love conquers evil. And God, help us to live in peace. Help us to live in wisdom. We don't know the answers, O oh God. But you know our groans, you know the thoughts of our hearts even before we speak them aloud. And you hear your people across the world. So we come to you with these prayers and all the prayers of our hearts as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Matthew 17, 1 through 9. I'm reading through the NIV version, which might be different than what's on the screen. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, John the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and he touched them. Get up, he said. Do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in a moment of centering silence. Gracious God, speak to us today. Speak to us and fill us with awe and wonder. You are God. And we are amazed in your presence. And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
I wonder if James and Peter and John ever talked about what they saw on the mountain. I suspect that they didn't, really, because sometimes we just don't have adequate words. Imagine for a moment trying to conjure up the image of a rainbow or a sunrise with words, trying to explain to someone what you saw if they had never seen such a thing and didn't know what that was. Words, even the words of the most gifted writers, will always fall short. How do you describe the experience of standing beside a redwood tree? Or that feeling of being in love? The sensation of attending a magnificent, glorious concert, this kind that brings a crowd to their feet. Or holding your newborn baby for the first time. Our words are never enough. Although we can try to use our words to connect to one another's knowledge and prior experiences of something similar, you maybe can describe some of the effect. You could say that you had goosebumps or chills during a performance. But you can't really pass that performance on to someone in any vivid, sensory way. Do you remember the solar eclipse of 2017? Maybe you were really into it. Or maybe, like me, you just kind of watch the people around you by their eclipse goggles and, um, or, or travel to the total eclipse path. I know that there are a few people here who did that. One of my friends had a big trip all scheduled around it. And afterward, she was just raving about how cool it was. What an amazing experience. To be honest, I didn't understand. I still don't really understand. Some of you can try to educate me afterwards if you saw it and it was amazing. But, you know, I had this conversation with her. I really wanted to understand. And so I tried to ask. I said, so you went to, I think it was Kentucky she went to. You went to Kentucky to see the darkness? Like, didn't it just look like night? She said, no, you don't understand. It was amazing. And I was like, OK, I'm really glad. But she couldn't explain to me why or tell me what she experienced. Some things are like that. They can't be explained or even described well. You just kind of have to be there. I think that Peter and James and John's experience on the mountaintop was probably like that. Now, the gospel writer who tells us the story, he wasn't there either, actually. He offers his best attempt to describe in words what was told to him in words. And we combine that with our imagination's best ability to work with metaphors. Jesus' face shone like the sun. We can't even look at the sun directly. His clothes became as white as light, Matthew tells us, which is more abstract than Mark's comparison with laundry. Mark says that Jesus' clothes were whiter than anyone could bleach them. It sounds like a commercial, actually. They're both trying to give words to something that can't really be captured by language, something that we can't really conceive. Which, you know, makes this kind of a hard passage to preach. What words do I say about the words that someone else said about an event that can't be described? But maybe that's the point of the transfiguration, leaving us speechless, leaving us in awe of that which is beyond the imagination. There's no real, like, takeaway point from this passage. The scripture doesn't give us a moral. It doesn't give us a teaching. It doesn't give us a, so go and do this thing. It just kind of gives us something to get lost in, something bigger than we can comprehend, wonder. Just when Peter thought he was starting to know and understand some things about Jesus, he was completely taken by surprise by something he never could have envisioned. Last, in last week's reading, 
We read about how it seemed like Peter knew. Peter had proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah. With his whole heart, he knew, he knew that this was the Christ. This was the one he had been waiting for his whole life. This was the one that people had been longing for over the course of generations. But Peter, like all the people before him, had some specific ideas about the Messiah. He had some expectations of what the Messiah would do. And when Jesus said he was going to be crucified, well, that wasn't one of them. So certain was Peter that he knew how this works, that he took Jesus aside to correct him, to scold him, so that he, Peter, could tell Jesus the correct answer. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. He's sure about this. Many of us suffer from certainty. We bring ideas about God from our childhood formation, the things that we've heard all of our lives. We bring our ideological convictions. We bring our own understanding of how things should work, according to us. And we think we know. We stop wondering, being curious, seeking, exploring, until we, too, are swept up in wonder and reminded that God is so much bigger, so much more than our understanding. Listen, said that voice. Up on the mountain, Jesus was dazzling. He was talking to the great prophets who came long before him. Time disappeared. Light was resplendent. Majesty abound. A voice spoke out of a cloud. We try to make sense of it and analyze it and explain it, but I think we're just meant to say, wow. Wow is praised when we are speechless. It's awe and wonder too big for us. We say wow when we face something beyond our control, beyond our imagining, something that takes us out of the vastness of the universe and outside of ourselves. Author Anne Lamott writes, when we are stunned to the place beyond words, when an aspect of life takes us away from being able to chip at it until it's down to something manageable and then file it away nicely. When all we can say in response is, wow, that's a prayer. No wonder Peter wants to build a shelter there. It was good to be there. Then out of a bright cloud came that voice declaring Jesus beloved, and the disciples fell face down on the ground, terrified. What was that? Again, they didn't know, they didn't understand. This was so far beyond them. All that time they'd spent walking with Jesus, following him, and they thought they'd gotten it. You know, they were sharing life with him. He was intimate, he was familiar. They thought they knew him. But now here they were on a mountain, caught up in glorious mystery. And it can't quite be captured. But Matthew tries his best, inviting us to be caught up in this mystery too. Matthew invites us to move from knowing faith, you know, that faith that tells us, here's the doctrine, here are the Bible stories, here are the takeaways of those Bible stories, here's the list of things that you're supposed to do, into a faith in Christ that causes us to just say, wow, God with us in our daily life and in the mundane, but also God beyond our wildest dreams. It's good to be there. I'll wrap up with another mountaintop story. Several years ago, my parents took a trip to Alaska and they were in Denali National Park. Denali is the highest mountain peak in North America, but the thing is that only about 30% of the visitors who go get to see it. Most of the time, it's hidden by clouds. And so my parents were there, and they were sitting in a restaurant that had a beautiful, scenic view. They were looking out at the magnificent landscape, and there was a mountain right in front of them. They could see it, and, and so my father remarked on how lucky they were to be in the 30% club. And the waiter, who had lived and worked there for several years said, sorry, that's not Denali. You can't see it right now, it's covered by the clouds. And my dad looked around him, and it was a beautiful day, the sky was bright blue, 
he saw a large mountain there. And so he remained convinced that, in fact, he was seeing it. There it is, right there. Uh, no, sir, that's not actually Denali. Now, at this point in the story, when they tell it, my mom always interjects to tell him, I don't know why you would think that you know better than someone who lives there. But my dad could not be dissuaded. He was sure that he knew there were no clouds, he said. And there was a mountain in front of him. It was beautiful. It was Denali. And then, sometime later, just for a moment, the view changed. The clouds around the mountain, clouds that were not visible, he said, cleared, and suddenly Denali came into view. And it was twice as high as the mountain that he had been looking at. It was snow-capped, and it was coming out of the clouds. He managed to catch, capture a photo of it, and if you look at the picture, if you see this glorious peak that emerges almost two miles higher than the height of the mountain below it, you look at it and you say, how could you confuse those two things? One was, oh yeah, that's nice, pretty landscape. The other weren't so wow, even in a photo. Sometimes we think we know, sometimes we think we know until true glory is revealed, until we witness transfiguration, until we can't even, until we see what we can't even conceive or explain or describe. It's enough to take your breath away. Wow. I wonder if Peter and James and John ever talked about the transfiguration. If they held to that when things got hard, when the world seemed more full of pain than glory, when they were exhausted and losing hope. I wonder what they said. Maybe not much at all. Maybe just a word or two brought them back to that mountaintop glory. Hey, Peter, do you remember... Wow. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's join together in singing O Wonder Sight, O Vision Fair. Um, And we'll sing to the tune of On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand without the refrain in it. I invite you to stand as you're able and comfortable. You may remain standing. We believe that the glory of God is at work around us and among us, doing things that are beyond even our wildest imagining. And so we offer our gifts, believing that God can transform them. We won't be passing the plates today. Um, There's an offering box at the back of the church that you can give if you would like to give um, on your way out. You can also give online. But we will bless those things together, and we will praise God for the work that God does through them. Let us join together in singing the doxology.
I invite you to remain standing as you're comfortable and we'll join together in singing sent forth by God's blessing. And now go forth, go forth amazed, go forth to encounter all the wonder in the world and to be surprised. Go knowing that God goes with you all the places you go. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.